And I think we'll go ahead and begin. So uh, welcome everyone to Grand Rounds. I am Dr. Betsy Trowbridge and I am stepping in for Dr. Schnapp today. And I wanna thank all of you for taking an hour of your time to take care of yourself and learn. And as all of you know, um, previously I would always have a little meteorological tip, so I couldn't uh, resist. And so I just want everyone to know that on September 22nd will be the autumnal equinox. It will be the beginning of fall. And so that is my tip for the day. And I am so excited to hear Dr. Nasia Safdar speak today. Is you know, in my mind, she has been our, our common reassurance, kind of in the center of swirling chaos for the past year and a half. And so I think hearing her grand rounds, the COVID-19 pandemic, the end of the beginning will be um, fascinating and excellent. I'd like to introduce Dr. David Andes, the Division Chief of Infectious Disease, who uh, is going to introduce Dr. Safdar. Dave, go ahead. Thanks, Dr. Portobridge. Uh, it's my honor um, to introduce Dr. Nasia Safdar, who I know really needs no introduction uh, for this group. And a proper introduction, unfortunately, would probably take up most of the hour. Um, so very briefly, uh, Dr. Safdar completed her medical degree in Aga Khan uh, before coming to uh, Madison, where she's completed residency, infectious disease fellowship, Master's of Science, PhD, uh, Women's Health Fellowship, uh, a number of other postdoctoral training opportunities before joining the faculty in 2006. Um, she has been a renowned and prolific clinician, investigator, uh, and leader in infection uh, control and prevention, uh, particularly in the area of uh, C. difficile. Uh, she has more than 340 high impact publications that have been cited more than 20,000 times. And she's been acknowledged for uh, the impact of her research uh, by numerous awards from the department, uh, the school, uh, the university, and literally every scientific society um, uh, that her work touches. Um, she's uh, most, the, the most recent award uh, Dr. Trowbridge mentioned is uh, her naming as the, the first Dennis Mackey endowed uh, uh, faculty fellow. I can't think of anybody more deserving uh, of that uh, prestigious honor. Um, and most importantly, as also as, as Betsy mentioned, Nasia has been the most calming and clear beacon of knowledge um, for our healthcare system, our patients and our community uh, during this pandemic and I'm um, excited to, to hear her uh, further uh, distill uh, what's going on. So with that, Nasia, I'll turn the stage over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Andes and Dr. Trowbridge. It's a real pleasure to be here this morning talking about COVID-19, uh, the end of the beginning. Um, I just have a few disclosures that are on the slide here. And you know, we could talk a lot about COVID and that would take up all, all day. So I'm going to focus on three main things today, and certainly people can ask me questions about testing and long COVID or so on. But the focus is going to be discuss some recent developments in the epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2, review transmission risk, especially with the Delta variant now being predominant, and then examine the therapeutic options for COVID-19. So let's begin by looking at what some of the updates in epidemiology have been. And I'm going to focus on the more recent advances I think when I mentioned the end of the beginning, you know, when the pandemic first started, of course, no one knew anything and we've learned a lot in that past year. But we, it has now evolved to the point that it's become a really, uh, an entirely different entity altogether. So focusing on the last few months is likely to be more helpful than reviewing the history of, of how it all began and so on. So, you know, as, as we all know, just looking around us, we had a bit of a reprieve in terms of uh, cases coming into our outpatient clinics and our inpatient setting, uh, but that's largely over. We're starting to see an increased number of visits of the emergency department in urgent cares. And the same is being reflected around the state and uh, in many states around the country. When we look at our recent hospitalization data, so this is just for the first two weeks of September. And you can see that, you know, when things were reasonably stable, we were averaging about 10 or so hospitalized patients at any given time. Um, and that number has started to creep up over the last month. So in, the, in this two week period that is on this slide, uh, 
Um, adult patients, 29 were admitted for COVID-19, and, and we do make a distinction between those who are admitted for COVID reasons versus those who are admitted for others. And the other is typically because they're either found to be positive at admission or it's a, a preoperative situation. Uh, we have also had a number of pediatric admissions. Uh, and when you look at them as all comers, you know, it gets alarming when you break it down into the numbers that are admitted for COVID versus admitted for other reason and found to be positive, then it's a more accurate reflection of what we're seeing. Also, you know, while this talk is about COVID, I don't think we want to lose sight of the fact that in respiratory virus season, we're going to be seeing other things. And the other thing that is sweeping the state right now is respiratory syncytial virus, which is in sharp contrast to the numbers that we have seen last year, in addition to COVID. This is what the situation looks like on the adult side. So again, this is for the first two weeks of September. There were 67 patients with laboratory confirmed COVID-19. The data on the right-hand column is pretty discouraging. There were only 22% that were fully vaccinated. Uh, this includes those who were admitted for COVID and those that were admitted for other reasons. And the median age over time has come down from the 70s, 80s, it was in the earlier days, and has remained stable at 51 now for, for several months. Over half of UW Health employees have had at least one test for COVID-19 since um, the pandemic began, and 10% have tested positive at any given time. We have a very low threshold for getting um, healthcare workers tested uh, for, for obvious reasons. Now, of course, as, as life um, starts to return to normal and to go on, because we, we couldn't have kept going with the fits and starts approach forever, uh, there are going to be an expected increase in the number of cases. The good news though for our own campus is that a large proportion of both students and employees have been vaccinated. Of course, there's room for improvement here too, but this is pretty encouraging news. Having said that, the group that is now testing positive are typically those with uh, either mild or moderate symptoms who um, need a COVID test to, to diagnose what they have. And you can see that over time, the positive test results by day um, are rising. This is of course not unique to our campus, Institutions of higher learning all around the country are seeing the same thing. Typically, there's a peak the first few weeks after classes start, and then it starts to stabilize to a more manageable level. Fortunately, no hospitalizations or complications have been reported in uh, patients testing positive at this time that are UW students. So what does the Wisconsin data look like? Well, um, Activity is either very high or high, and the difference between high and very high is, is pretty arbitrary. Um, so 56 counties have very high activity. The uptake as a state for the vaccine is hovering around 50 to 55 percent. So of course, there's room for improvement there, even though Dane County specifically is better than the rest with about 72 percent uh, people that have had at least one dose of the vaccine. I think when we look at the number of new confirmed cases, which is a seven day average, um, and the percent positive by test, it's pretty clear that we are on the upswing. Um, and every so often we think that maybe we've stabilized and maybe we've plateaued, but I don't think we can say that at this point, either for the state or for locally for us. These are just the benchmarks for what's considered low, moderate, and high. You can see that it takes a lot to go to either moderate or, and low, and we've never really been at a low level ever since this all began. So I don't expect that we'll get there anytime soon. And when you look at the um, disease activity, this is the breakdown across the various counties. A lot of it is reflected in vaccination rates and um, the counties with lower vaccination rates as expected have higher case counts. When we look at Dane County specifically, um, you know, the middle column there, people who are hospitalized at the time that I took a screenshot of this, it was stable, but now it's actually on the increase. And I think we're seeing that in the people that are coming into the health system as well. Vaccination progress continues to happen, but um, is slower, I think, than one would like, just nationwide, not just for Dane County. The COVID-19 inpatients and inpatients in the ICU trend has crept up a little bit, is somewhat stable, but on a day-to-day -day basis, there is a need to, to evaluate to see whether we have the capacity and, uh, and the ability. Unfortunately, thus far, you know, we're in a reasonable situation when you look at Idaho, for instance, that has adopted crisis standards of care, you know, on hopes we don't get there, but it's something that we have to plan for and be prepared for if we do. The age range that is responsible for the vast majority of cases has hovered between, it seems, in the early 30s and now with the cases rising on the UW campus, it's likely going to also include the 18 to 22 year old 
population. And when we look at hospital bed capacity, so um, you can see here what the hospital bed situation looks like. It's, um, it's not as bad as one would think, but it's you know still the beginning of the fall season. And so we'll see which way things go as far as hospitalizations and the need for medical care arises. This infographic I think has been very useful for those of us who are asking individuals to get vaccinated because it clearly shows what the difference in outcomes are between people who get vaccinated and those who don't. So on the left you have in the light blue is a number of cases. So 125 per 100,000 vaccinated people compared to 369 per 100,000 not fully vaccinated people. So a sharp rise there for the unvaccinated folks. The same is true for hospitalizations. The difference in hospitalization rates is very compelling. And the same is true for mortality. So there is no doubt that the vaccinations have made a huge difference. And one can only imagine what our situation would have been now if we didn't have the vaccine options that we do. Even though I realize that we might be feeling a little bit discouraged as vaccine effectiveness has not quite remained the same as when it started. But look at the difference here between the rate of confirmed and probable cases. So again, in the middle column there is fully vaccinated people on the right hand side is uh, people who are not and you can see the difference. So if we look at it over time, uh, the difference has become a little bit less stark. So in February, look at the difference between cases and fully vaccinated and unvaccinated. And then if we go to July, you can see the difference still persists, but it might not be as large as when we started out. This is the, so that was the case count. This is hospitalizations. Same thing here. I think when we look at the hospitalized for 100,000 fully vaccinated people, you can see that in February, it was 1.8 compared with 18. And then in July, it went from 4.9 to 18.2. Nonetheless, really compelling data for the effectiveness of the vaccine. Um, this the, the, the death rate is no different. It was um, very different early on, and it remains higher in the unvaccinated group at this point as well. So if we just look at a smattering of Midwestern states, including some in the Northeast that are um, doing well with vaccination, you can see that Connecticut has very high vaccination rates, still room for improvement, but better than, than many other states. Uh, and their rate of COVID is, is very low. When you look at Tennessee here, you can see that the case count is high in red, and that's one of the states with the lower vaccination rates. We are very similar to other states in the Midwest. Uh, and even though you'll notice that Minnesota, for instance, has a minus 22% change here, that actually has flipped over the last week to now showing an increase. So we're all in largely the same situation here. And if we see a, a surge bigger than what we're seeing now, it will likely sweep the Midwest at the same time. Now, one of the things that has been concerning as schools have opened up is the difference in hospitalizations that are happening with for COVID-19 among children and adolescents. And you can see that over time, there has been a clear increase. It hasn't been a sharp jump at any given point in time. It's, it's been a gradual increase, uh, but nonetheless, a number of cases have risen. And if we look at the overall uh, zero to 17 years, that line is going up as, as is the 12 to 17 and the five to 11. The five to 11, of course, is concerning because that group of individuals cannot be vaccinated at this point and um, is with schools back in session, there's a lot of mingling and, and so on. So something to keep an, an, an eye on at this point. And just as we have a multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children that's been well described, there is also now reports of one happening in adults. The case definition is very similar, except that the individual is an adult. It's still a very rare complication, uh, but something to watch for as it develops two to 12 weeks after the initial illness. Um, and what you need is a presence of a severe illness requiring hospitalization with marked organ dysfunction and markedly elevated acute inflammatory markers. So very similar and the pathogenesis, I think, still under investigation. Uh, but the existence of this now has been well described in adults, uh, rarer than it is in children. So what can we say about transmission? I think it's safe to say that Delta has really altered the transmission trajectory of this virus. And there are many examples that you will find in the literature where there's clearly airborne transmission of Delta in situations where there's poor ventilation or in situations where you cannot explain it by other means. I'll just give an example of this one situation in a classroom in California, where if you look here, so here's a teacher's desk. The teacher was unvaccinated, was symptomatic and had attributed the symptoms to allergies. They were unmasked because they were reading to the children and felt that it would help the children to, to see them as they did that. And you can see the 
the cases that tested positive um, correlated directly with proximity to the teacher. So most of the students in the first two rows here, and none of the students were vaccinated because of age, uh, and they tested positive between two to 14 days after exposure to the teacher. Um, there was a air filter in the room, the doors and windows were left open, and the desks were six feet apart, and the distance between the teacher and the students were, was also six feet. Upon interviewing the students, it turned out that all of them had been wearing their masks diligently as they had been instructed to do, and the only person who was unmasked was the instructor. So that, if nothing else, I think tells us two things. One is that transmission from symptomatic individuals is way more important than transmission from asymptomatic. Not that it doesn't happen from asymptomatic, and of course, given the sheer volume of numbers, it accounts for a significant proportion of cases, um, but a symptomatic individual is at much higher risk of transmission, understandably, because of the aerosols and the amount of virus in the aerosols um, than an asymptomatic individual. And masking is an effective measure for source control. It's also an effective measure for protecting the wearer, um, but of the two types of situations, you know, protecting the, um, the wearer versus source control for the person who has the infection, um, it is much more important for source control. The R naught is, or the reproductive number is the way that we measure how contagious a particular entity is. And you look at the, with the ancestral strain of COVID, it was about 2.4 to 2.6, meaning that about two people were infected from the index case. Uh, then there was a version that caused Europe's first wave, which was three, then there was alpha, and now there's delta, which is about five to eight. So with that kind of R naught numbers, you know that about five to eight additional people will be infected, which makes it very challenging for containment. This is still nowhere near what mumps and measles and chickenpox are, which are among the most contagious of infectious conditions. Um, but certainly, you know, it, um, we know that it's a lot more transmissible than, than the ancestral virus strains. So what can we say about vaccine effectiveness going forward? I think it's instructive to look back a little bit here and, and see what the vaccine effectiveness was like in the um, earlier days when the vaccine first became available, which was January through March uh, 2021. This was a study from the CDC of healthcare workers. Healthcare workers are generally considered a good group to assess vaccine effectiveness in because one, they're broadly speaking a healthy cohort, and the other is that there's ongoing exposure to the virus so you can really see and evaluate breakthrough infections. So pre-Delta, which is what you see here, for people that received uh, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, vaccine effectiveness was very, very high, ranging from 86% to 96.9%. And that I think was reflected in what we saw. There were several weeks um, all the way from January through July when all of a sudden employee infections plummeted. We had several weeks where we had zero infections and that's not the case anymore, which I think is reflective of somewhat waning immunity over time. But if we don't look at healthcare workers, if we just look at hospitalized adults age 65 or older, we can see that the same thing applied there. Full vaccination conferred an amazing amount of immunity and very high vaccine effectiveness. Slightly less as you went down to partial vaccination and so on. But if you were fully vaccinated, you could be very certain that you were well protected. So what happened after during Delta? Well, we know vaccine effectiveness during Delta is lower. This was a, a repeat study of healthcare workers, multiple states, uh, but this time they included the period when Delta became predominant, which was sometime over the summer of this year. So you can look at pre-Delta variant predominance, fully vaccinated, vaccine effectiveness in the orange here is 91% with a range here. And with the Delta variant predominance, vaccine effectiveness has dropped and be as low as 26% and as high as 84 with an average of 66. So I think what that tells us is then that over time, and this could be a function of waning immunity, or this could be a function of Delta being more predominant, but either way, we can no longer look forward to the same protection that we had in the earlier days when vaccines first became available. There's much less data on the other vaccines that are um, being used in this country and around the world, but I think the gist that people are seeing is the same. And this was recently published just a couple of weeks ago which is exactly what we're seeing, resurgence of SARS-CoV-2 infection in a highly vaccinated healthcare system workforce. Over 90% of our healthcare workers are vaccinated. And you can see that vaccine effectiveness, if we go all the way from March, um, 93, 96, 95, and then came to 65 in, in July, which is when we started to see increasing cases. This is the University of California healthcare system that 
publish these results. So all of that might seem a little bit discouraging, but just imagine what the situation would have been if we hadn't been vaccinated. And so that's pretty easy. One doesn't have to imagine it. All you have to do is look at rates in unvaccinated people versus vaccinated. And so this is um, infection rates here and hospitalization rates here and a massive difference between people who are fully vaccinated uh, over here versus those who are unvaccinated. That difference, as we showed earlier, continues to persist. So vaccination still remains our best and biggest defense against SARS-CoV-2. The waning immunity question is actually a subject of active discussion right now with the FDA and the AIC at ACIP meeting. Um, FDA, I think, is today, and ACIP will likely be next week when they will discuss what to do about the boosters. And the trouble with, with the boosters, of course, is that it's confounded by Delta. It's also confounded by behavior change because as people started to get vaccinated, we started to mingle, we started to wear masks less often. Mobility levels actually are at pre-COVID levels and masking is only about 20 to 30% of the population. Certainly better in some places than others, um, but for all the reasons that we know about, people tend to be reluctant about, about masking in public. So are we topping off versus are we actually prolonging immunity? There's data from Israel that suggests that vaccine effectiveness uh, over time has waned even when Delta wasn't as predominant. So perhaps there is a reason for the boosters, but I think that it will not be a, a slam dunk decision necessarily, even though it eventually may come down to the fact that yes, we need a booster. The one exception though is immunocompromised hosts. And of course that additional dose has already been approved, but the 2.7% of the US population that is immunocompromised in one way or the other, uh, we do need to study how the vaccine behaves in that population. And of course, there's a number of really good reasons why you might consider an additional dose in that population, um, ranging from much more likely to get severely ill from COVID. There's a higher risk for prolonged shedding. We've seen that in a number of our patients where we have CT values or cycle threshold values that remain very low, suggesting that the viral load is still very high, uh, several days to weeks after the initial infection. There's also low antibody neutralization titers to SARS-CoV-2 variants in this population and they are more likely to transmit to household contacts because they remain infectious for longer. A number of breakthrough infections that we have seen in our fully vaccinated people have also been um, in those who are immunocompromised. So a number of good reasons to, to worry about this group here. And when we look at vaccine effectiveness, I showed you some numbers about how great it looks in people who aren't immunocompromised. When you look at the immunosuppressed population, you can see that depending upon how many doses people have received, it could be as low as 25% after the first dose of the mRNA vaccine for that population. And if we break it down into different subgroups of immunocompromise, in this study, they looked at people, and this is the percent antibody response here. So you can see that in some populations, even though they're immunocompromised, the antibody response wasn't terrible. It's pretty good here, as in hemodialysis. Solid organ transplant, I think, is particularly vulnerable because their antibody responses are very low. Um, and then this is a bunch of other immunosuppressive therapies where there's a lot of variation compared to healthy controls. So what happens when you give a third dose to this population? Well, the results look a lot more encouraging. So among those, and this is a smattering of four different studies that have evaluated this, if you didn't have detectable antibody response to an initial mRNA series, about 50%, as high as 50%, developed an antibody response to an additional dose. So rather than calling this a booster, I think this may just be the schedule that immunocompromised patients need to receive because it takes a third dose to give them appreciable uh, protective antibody response. Now, of course, there's a lot of caveats with only detecting antibodies, and there's a lot of variation in the tests that one can do. Uh, but even with all those limitations, it seems that this is the right population that should receive uh, an extra dose. So the two distinct potential uses for an additional vaccine dose are, um, is it likely to be needed when the initial immune response is insufficient, which is the case in the immunocompromised population, or is it a booster when we think that the initial sufficient response has waned over time, and that's what the discussion is actively underway for the rest of the population. Even if the booster is approved, it is likely that it will first be available only for those who have received the Pfizer vaccine, followed probably closely by Moderna, um, very little data on J&J at this point, but I, I think it's only a matter of time before that recommendation will, will also be made. Now, what about mixed dose theories? Um, there are questions arising in people who had maybe the Pfizer mRNA vaccine in the beginning, and now with the booster, does it matter what 
what type they get. There's an active study ongoing in the UK that is um, intentionally assigning mixed dose regimens to be able to study their response. But in observational studies um, and in this one trial that mentioned, there doesn't seem to be harm in mixing um, dose series and there may be some uh, superior immunogenicity, although I think evidence for that needs to really be bolstered before it becomes a recommendation of any kind. I think the bottom line here is that if you have the same vaccine available, that's still preferred that you take that, but if you don't, then mixing doses is okay. So what can we look forward to um, for the rest of the fall and, and next year? This is a mixture of several different models that the CDC has compiled. The IHME one here from Seattle is the one that many of you may be familiar with, but there's a lot of, uh, of different ones and they all have different underlying assumptions. So the idea is to combine some of them in some way and to display them so that people can realize the various differences that might exist. So these are national projections and I think um, some of them show that the cases are likely going to stably increase uh, in some areas, depending upon whether the peak has already occurred, cases may actually decline. And I think for Wisconsin, the projection is at least for until October is that we expect to see a rising case count. To what extent it rises the way that it is now, I think is, is the question. And the booster coming right in the middle of it may help to some extent. So what happens with um, people who are vaccinated who still get a breakthrough infection and what is their uh, chances of transmitting COVID-19 to their loved ones or, or other close contacts? Uh, on the left, you see how Delta has really taken over in terms of being the most predominant strain, whether one is vaccinated or whether one is partially vaccinated or unvaccinated, Delta in July and, and to this day has become the predominant strain. There's a lot more sequencing going on now than there was in the earlier days of the pandemic. And so this data has, uh, has really been bolstered in terms of what's circulating. And it didn't take very long either for Delta to, to sweep the globe. Uh, on the right-hand side, you have a comparison of CT values um, in PCR. And CT values are, as we know, used as a proxy for viral infectiousness. So low CT values indicate potentially high viral infectiousness. And in May, you can see that unvaccinated people had lower CT values um, than fully vaccinated people right here. Partially vaccinated was really no different. However, this difference was really flattened out in June and in July when Delta became predominant, such that there's really no difference in CT values between those who are vaccinated and those who are not. I think it's important to emphasize that there's a couple of things here. One is that much as we use and like CT values, we don't really care about them. What we care about is how many individuals are infected by someone who's vaccinated and gets COVID versus somebody who's unvaccinated and gets COVID. And that clinical data I'll show you in a second now is starting to, to come out. And the other thing is that, you know, CT value is one point in time. So it may be that vaccinated individuals can still shed virus once they get COVID, but the, there are emerging studies that seems to suggest that the duration of shedding is much shorter because of the individuals being much less symptomatic than in someone who's not vaccinated. So there is still, I think, cause for hope in this situation. This was a very interesting study that was just published in the New England Journal. This is how um, England is a little bit ahead of us in some respects because they're able to capture all the COVID cases in the country. This is a large cohort observational study. So all the COVID cases in the country, and um, this is during the time of of uh, Delta and vaccination. And they were also able to ascertain the vaccination status of the people. So just to orient us to the slide here. So this is the vaccination status of the index patient. None of the household contacts were vaccinated. If they were, the data was censored. And this is the number of secondary cases that occurred from that one case. So for people who were not vaccinated, it was 10% secondary cases for people who were vaccinated, and this was the Pfizer vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine. So for either of these groups, if they had been fully vaccinated, and well, I, no, I shouldn't say fully, if they'd been vaccinated more than 21 days before testing positive, um, the risk of secondary cases was much lower. Most of the individuals in this study had actually only received the first dose of the vaccine, not the full two dose series. So that's probably even more compelling if we were to redo the study um, at this point. So the risk of transmission certainly is there, 
but it is much, much less if one is vaccinated versus not. So very encouraging news in, in my opinion, based on what we're seeing here. Now, serology is, is a subject of intense debate that we should talk about briefly, if only to state that there's about 87 individual serology assays that are out there that have uh, obtained emergency use authorization. Most are qualitative, the value of which is really pretty limited. Some are semi-quantitative and only one is quantitative. There are a lot more in development. And most measure IgG antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 to either the viral nucleocapsid protein or the spike protein. Vaccination confers the antibodies to the spike protein. The nucleocapsid is for natural disease. So if you want to find out if somebody has antibody response following natural disease, then it would be the nucleocapsid protein. The spike also rises with natural. So if you just do that, you wouldn't be able to tell if it was a vaccination, if they'd been vaccinated, or if it was natural immunity. So I think the utility of this routinely is still pretty limited, but I think there's a lot more potentially uh, promising serology tests on the horizon, because now people are starting to report neutralization antibody results. Uh, and eventually, I think very soon, there will be data on serological correlates of, of protection. Because right now we don't have a threshold. You know, If you have a low antibody response, what does that mean? If it's undetectable, yes, it's concerning. Uh, but even if it's undetectable, of course, there's the whole T cell arm of, of the immune um, cascade that may still confer protection. So I can't say that we have found the answer to what the best uh, serologic test to do is, but there is certainly advancements on the horizon. So let's move on now to COVID therapeutics and talk about the various options that are available. And I just want to acknowledge the work of the Consider Work Group at UW uh, that includes Anne Mish as the chair and a number of individuals from the Department of Medicine and, and the health system who have really taken the time to do a deep dive into the therapeutics and create our own guideline that is uh, mirrors the NIH guidelines. So therapeutic wise, you can either have antiviral therapies or you can have immune modulator therapies. And the longer you go into the course of the illness, the more likely it is that you will need immune modulator therapies because the direct antiviral effect uh, is not as important since the virus may no longer be in the system, but what it has left behind is clearly causing people to feel very sick. Um, look at the options for exposed asymptomatic infected individuals. So if you're um, not in the hospital, there's really not very many options that people can use. For the early symptomatic group, also there's just the one option. And understandably, most of the efforts have focused on what to treat people with who are hospitalized and what to treat people with who are critically ill. And we'll review some of these with some limited data. There's a lot of uh, data out there. But I wanted to mention monoclonal antibodies because there are some new things that we should all be aware of. So there are three different types of combinations that are now available. Uh, two of them are approved for treatment only, but one of them, which is the Regeneron product, is approved for treatment and post-exposure prophylaxis. The post-exposure prophylaxis is relatively new um, authorization, and so just something that we want to be aware of. The group that would benefit the most is somebody who is at high risk for complications and is unvaccinated and is a household contact of somebody who's tested positive for COVID. There would be a lot of such people, I think, that would meet criteria, and so we just want to keep track of that uh, and apply this guideline as, uh, as applicable. But what is the data for efficacy though for these monoclonal antibodies? This is one, there are many others. Some of these are still in preprint form, um, but when we look at uh, BAM lenivimab plus adesivimab, this was one randomized double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trial. They had about a thousand non-hospitalized adults. So the indication for the monoclonal antibody is you have to be non-hospitalized and you have to have mild to moderate symptoms without the need for additional supplemental oxygen if you're on some baseline or without the need for any oxygen if you aren't on any baseline. And you're at high risk for progressing to severe COVID-19. So if you use those criteria, about half of them received a single infusion of the monoclonal antibody and the other half received placebo. The primary endpoint was whether one required hospitalizations or died of any cause during 29 days of follow-up. Uh, and you can see that the results were pretty compelling. So 7% of patients who received placebo had either needed hospitalization or died during the course of the follow-up compared to 2% of people that were treated with the monoclonal antibody. These are pretty compelling findings, which is about a 70% reduction that have been found with the other types of monoclonal antibodies as well, and led to an FDA emergency use authorization for the use of these products for outpatients with COVID. 
All 10 deaths in this study occurred in the placebo group. Now, what about uh, casarivimab and indevimabab for post-exposure prophylaxis? Um, this was another randomized double-blind placebo control trial. So these are now household contacts of individuals infected with SARS-CoV-2. Cases were confirmed using PCR. There was an 80% reduction in confirmed symptomatic COVID-19 cases observed with a Regeneron uh, product compared to placebo at uh, day 29. So pretty compelling. I think the, the main thing with any of these monoclonal antibodies is that because they're either IV or sub-Q, it's the administration and the logistics of it that pose a challenge. But there doesn't appear to be a capacity issue in the sense that there's no shortage um, of the product itself. And the latest one is uh, Sotrivimab, which is the Comet ICE trial. Same thing here, this is a preprint. You can see that these are people that um, had risk factors for progression to severe disease and the outcomes uh, in terms of efficacy for this monoclonal antibody was 7% um, of people with hospitalization or death compared with 1% with the active product here. So I think on the outpatient side, this is going to be our mainstay for trying to prevent hospitalization and complications. But is there the possibility of resistance to these monoclonal antibodies? This is the subject of intense study. And for, for some period there, the FDA um, reversed the EUA for the combination of uh, BAM um, and uh, ETE because they were concerned about uh, potential uh, concerns about resistance. And now that's come back. And so distribution is no longer paused in the US. BAM labimumab alone, though, is no longer an acceptable agent because of uh, resistance to by the virus to this entity. Whether the clinical impact is the same as what the in vitro susceptibility tells us is really unknown at this point. But the current available options all are expected to have activity and should be used in, in the right population. This is a non-exhaustive list of risk factors that increase your likelihood of progression to severe COVID-19. Um, I think it's worthwhile to review this for your patient population. Of course, the same is true for healthcare workers who come down with COVID. If you're in a group <coughs> where you have a high risk of um, complications, one should consider the monoclonal antibody as a, as a really good option. Some of the other therapeutics that we're going to touch on, there's pretty compelling data on as well. And I think one of the oldest and truest options has really worked out for COVID, which is dexamethasone. The endpoint from this UK trial was 28 day mortality, a pretty compelling reduction in mortality with people who received dexamethasone compared with people who received usual care. I think it is a reflection of these therapies and hospitalized patients that has led to a marked improvement in outcomes compared to you know, the first six months of the pandemic when there was such a high mortality rate. Uh, and uh, tocilizumab is another agent which is an immune modulator at this point. Also, 28-day um, cumulative event rate of looking at mechanical ventilation or death. The situation looks much better with TOSI than it does with placebo, and so it is recommended for use in critically ill patients who are expected to have uh, to require mechanical ventilation. The latest one is veracitinib plus remdesivir. I didn't say a lot about remdesivir because I think the data, whether it is as effective as we think it is, is really, it's pretty mixed. Um, at best, it has modest effect, and at worst, it may not have an effect at all. Uh, but baricitinib plus remdesivir in this trial did improve recovery time from seven days to eight days in the placebo. It improved time to recovery among patients who were receiving high flow oxygen by quite uh, several days from 18 to 10, uh, and very few serious adverse events and actually more in the placebo group than in the treatment group. So this, I think, is also a good option for those who are hospitalized. What we really need though, in addition to these agents, is treatment options for people who are not hospitalized, who uh, may be sick in, in addition to the monoclonal antibody that we have. So I mentioned our own guidelines are on Uconnect from the consider group. These on this slide are the NIH guidelines. Um, and the gist of it is that there's an antiviral that remdesivir, which one can do earlier on in the illness as one progresses through and becomes more critically ill and requires ICU care. 
you have a variety of immune modulators typically um, added to dexamethasone. There are a lot of things, unfortunately, that didn't quite pan out. And perhaps the most disappointing among these is convalescent plasma, which for all intents and purposes really should have. Uh, but that's the reason one does trials and that's the reason we don't want to uh, willy-nilly accept things just because we think they should work. Uh, and the list here, you know, is likely to go on about things that don't work, which is not to be viewed as discouragement because it is equally important to know what things don't work as it is to find out what things do. There's about almost 400 treatments and 241 antivirals under study. I think what has received uh, recent media attention has been the vast increase in ivermectin fills. This is from a um, a pharmacy that's online that um, boasts its data on how many fills for various um, medications. And the pink is 2019, the purple here is 2020. The fill rate has exceeded uh, by far what it should be. Uh, and um, it led the FDA to post what should be a pretty self-evident statement. Um, but I think it's a little bit unclear why people are choosing to embrace unproven therapies, but yet uh, refusing to be vaccinated. Uh, and finally, I'll just end by describing the ACTIVE-6 trial, which is testing several medications, is sponsored by the NIH, can be uh, participated from anywhere in the US, and medications are shipped at no cost. And the question is, what are they studying in the ACTIVE-6 study? Uh, fluticasone, which may be potentially promising, fluvoxamine, and ivermectin is also one of the arms of study. So perhaps we'll wait to see what this trial shows, uh, but there may be some potentially promising options. So what is the end game with COVID-19? I think the end game is to make it a manageable threat. I think initial expectations of elimination or eradication, or if it's going to go away, are not likely to pan out. It would likely stay endemic. It will become a part of respiratory virus season like uh, many other viruses are. And what we really need is more oral medications for outpatient use that are easy to administer and a few side effects or no side effects, ideally. I think we need to refine a vaccination schedule. And most importantly, we want to make vaccines available to children uh, as quickly as one can. We are a site for the Moderna pediatric trial. And um, I think uh, the NIH and the CDC believe that a pediatric vaccine may be available by the end of this year. And that would be really very welcome news. Um, and hopefully then we can work on something else besides COVID at some point. I will conclude um, at this point. I just want to acknowledge all the entities that have supported the work uh, thank you very much and be happy to answer questions. Nasia, that was fantastic. Um, you are kind of an expert at perusing questions. Would you like me to ask you or would you like to just go ahead and go through the questions? Uh, let me see if I can do this here. Okay. All right, so Bat Brenner wonders, has anyone looked at COVID zero prevalence in Northern Wisconsin, any way to factor our comparison? Yes, you know, we are very excited about potentially ongoing uh, results, of, uh, results of ongoing zero prevalence studies. All of the ones that I've seen still are from 2020, which is useful and showed about a 10% prevalence in Wisconsin and many other um, states as well. But there hasn't been anything for this year thus far. They're all happening, and so I expect we'll find some results, but, but don't have those yet. The only one I've seen, which has come with a lot of caveats about methodologic limitations, has been the one from India, where they showed almost a 70% zero prevalence positivity uh, in, in individuals where um, COVID really ravaged those regions. Uh, so the next one is COVID-19 transmission from vaccinated individuals with infection slide. Are all those individuals doing the transmission symptomatic. So they can't really um, have um, reliable data on, on that study. And they mentioned that as one of the limitations. But most people did have symptoms. They just couldn't say that if all of them did. Um, typically, they were mild symptoms. Any data on antibody response to vaccine in patients who were pregnant at time of vaccine? Should they be considering third dose? You know, I think this is going, going to be one of those trade-off questions. Uh, we know the vaccine is safe in pregnant patients. There's a lot of data on that. And I think the question is whether they would be considered for a third dose. My inclination is that they would be, but I think we'll find out um, very early next week if that'll be the case. Can you discuss vaccine-associated myocarditis in children? Uh, 
Well, I think I can discuss what we know about it, which is that it is a rare complication, but it does appear to be associated with vaccine use. Um, I think in terms of, you know, should this dissuade somebody from getting the vaccine, given the rates that occur of vaccine associated myocarditis, I would say no. And the various approving entities say the same thing that we should still administer it to children, uh, but it is listed as a rare um, complication of the vaccine. Do projections include vaccine being approved for and administered to children in winter or spring? So the projections are for approval this winter. I think by the time everything is said and done and it started to be administered, it would likely be, be spring. Of course, it's been said before that a pediatric vaccine was going to be available very soon and it hasn't happened. So I would just give it a little bit of a lag time here, but um, I think that uh, it will happen. Uh, certainly the approval I think is likely to happen by the end of this year. Any studies correlating risk or outcome relative absolute lymphocyte count? Um, you know, I don't know that I'm an expert on this because I haven't reviewed the literature specific to whether there's a, a lymphocyte count question, but I can get back to you on that one. Why do some studies not consider people who receive J&J fully vaccinated? Um, you know, I think if that's the case, that's probably a flaw there because if you've received the schedule, which is a single dose for J&J, you are to be considered fully vaccinated. In our interpretation of uh, vaccines and their effectiveness, we are considering that to be a fully vaccinated situation. Is there a clinical utility for checking COVID antibody response to the third dose in immunocompromised patients? Well, I think the clinical utility could be there for certain patients, but because of the difficulties in interpreting that data, it's not recommended that it be used routinely. So for instance, if you find a detectable antibody response, then that may reassure the patient and that's great. But even if you don't find it, they may still be protected after the third dose. And so, you know, I think on a case by case basis, one could entertain it, but not routinely. Could you comment on the Pfizer funded study in NAGM on a dofacitinib? Uh, you know, only in the briefest of ways. Um, I've reviewed the literature on it, but not to the extent that I can say too much about it, except that it could be used as a substitute for daracitinib, which there appears to be a shortage of since that's really an RA medication and it's needed for that group. Is there a difference in viral shedding between vaccinated and unvaccinated? Yeah, so, you know, there are some differences in studies there. There are studies that have shown that viral shedding as measured by the CT value is the same in people who are vaccinated versus not, but it typically is done at only one point in time. And there are other studies that looked at longitudinally and found that the total duration of viral shedding is less in people who are vaccinated versus not. I think it's safe to say that, that viral shedding overall is going to be less in people who are vaccinated, but there likely will be some. It won't be you know, none. And that's um, something to be aware of, which is why masking has such an important role to play still for management of the pandemic. If J&J has a much lower vaccine effectiveness, why not vaccinate them with Pfizer or Moderna? I think that's likely going to be the case going forward. I mean, there's a, a whole slew of vaccines that are available and in this country, we have these three, but of course, worldwide, there's a list of about 10. And so um, it's likely going to be that there's will be a lot of mixing of different vaccines. Natural versus vaccine immunity. So natural immunity, is somewhat uh, less predictable, of course, than vaccine-induced immunity. And the differences in natural immunity is that it does seem to be a function of whether you are asymptomatic, have mild symptoms, or severe symptoms. And so you cannot predict for certain that you're immune if you have, say, um, a mild case or an asymptomatic case of COVID, which is why it's recommended that even people who've had COVID still get the vaccine. Do we know if sources of IVIG are starting to contain anti-COVID antibodies as we assume more of the people have been vaccinated or have had COVID? Yes, I think it's safe to assume that. I don't know if we, we know exactly to what extent and what the titers are, but of course there's high titer convalescent plasma that's available now, um, not the same as IVIG. I, I think it's safe to assume that that's going to be the case. Would you consider all patients with cancer eligible for the third dose or only those who are receiving immunosuppressive chemotherapy? You know, I would say that I have a pretty low threshold for um, immune compromise consideration in people with cancer. And so I would consider all those who are with cancer eligible for the third dose. Data points towards waning immunity and a booster seems most logical. Why are we delaying it? Well, I think there's, uh, there's two reasons. One is scientific and the other is ethical. 
The scientific reason is that we may think the data is compelling based on what we're reading, but the FDA and the CDC have access to far more unpublished data that we don't. And they don't seem to think that it's a slam dunk, which is why I think it's worth the time to really discuss that in the panel and see. The ethical constraint, which the WHO has laid out really well, is that the vast majority of the world hasn't even had a single dose, and we're talking about boosters. And so if they're indicated, by all means, but we really want to make sure they're indicated. Who is providing ivermectin scripts and why would they? Well, you would be amazed. Apparently, you don't need an ivermectin script if you're taking ivermectin for veterinarian purposes, and you can go to any store and request that for an animal and then take it yourself. Um, I, there, there probably are other people who are also giving scripts, but uh, it's, it's not within anybody's recommendations to do so. Consider committee currently updating guideline to include baricitinib. Thank you. Oh, that was from Ann Mish. Are vaccinated patients at higher risk for cancer or other non-COVID-19 infections because of suppression of T8 cells? Um, doesn't appear to be, at, you know, it, potentially an active question, but um, has not appeared to be the case thus far. Of course, it's still early days with the vaccine. Wondering about the availability and cost of the monoclonal that you mentioned for pre-hospitalization treatment. So the monoclonal antibodies are available. It's um, given directly through DHS. They are free of charge. At the UW Health System, there is a hotline that you call and they can get you in and it's administered in the infusion center. I think capacity is a concern because one has to fit this in, in addition to all the other work that the infusion center does. And because these are patients with active COVID, we do have to follow stringent infection control precautions. That being said, I think the demand for these is going to go up and we have to be prepared for that, but it is at no cost to the patient. What do I tell my patients who are immunosuppressed and want to have antibody testing? And then what do we do with the info if I cannot talk them out? I think this is the reason I mentioned, you know, if you have to do it on a case by case basis for reassurance purposes, I think that's not unreasonable as long as we do the right test. If you're looking for vaccine induced immune, um, immunity, you really want the spike protein. And as you're ordering it, you wanna make sure that the test says that because many tests will do the nucleocapsid um, test and that is not vaccine induced immunity. Have we seen post-vaccination infections and other infectious disease vaccines like what we're seeing with COVID? I mean, I think breakthrough infections are not uncommon with many other types of infections. Um, it just is a matter of two things. You know, what is the virus or entity that is circulating in the community and how exposed one is to it? If it weren't for Delta, even if vaccine immunity wanes over time, nobody would have really cared because the strain would not have been as transmissible and infection counts would have been low. But measles is a great example of breakthrough infections. Um, regarding immunocompromised patients and their risk of severe disease, is there a difference between patients who were not immunocompromised at the time of their first two and became immunocompromised later? I think that level of granularity, we don't really know about. Most of the studies that have looked at that have considered people who are already immunocompromised to begin with. Uh, but as time goes on, I think that question could be answered better than it is now. Can you comment on the timing of vaccination after infection recovery? So, you know, as soon as one has recovered, one can, can get the vaccine. For the monoclonal antibody, there's a stipulation for 90 days that after you receive that, you have to wait 90 days for the vaccine. But in terms of COVID-19 infection itself, as soon as one is recovered, there should be consideration to, to getting the vaccine. Nasia, uh, thank you very much. Were there any other questions that you saw there? Um, let me just look at the Q&A here. Q&A is cleared. Uh, there's one question in the chat at 8.44. Can, Clint, can you just read that to us by any chance? <laughs> I will do my best. Any information on anti-AL1 therapies for use of COVID-19? Um, not at this point that I have, yeah. And Nasia, a question about um, these open air large number of events like the Badger games or volleyball games or football games, will it be two to 14 days before we see the potential effects of that? Yeah, I mean, I think we're already starting to see it on the campus population from the game that um, happened about two weeks ago. I think those kinds of rises are going to be inevitable. As we saw from the pictures and maybe people were there, you know, hardly anyone was masked. Well, Nasia, thank you. 
again. Um, one more question. Okay. Yep. Yep. One more question. Sam's got a question. Or actually, it's just gratitude. I believe. Okay. Sam's was gratitude. Thank you for your efforts, Dr. Softar, and for the attention and for the efforts of hospitalist colleagues and pulmonary critical co care colleagues um, leading the response to COVID 19. Um, I couldn't say that more. And Nasia, you know, there were over 400 people consistently for this talk, which I think just demonstrates how much we really need the science uh, behind what's happening and to understand it. So thank you very much. Dr. Andes, any closing thoughts? No, just thank you again. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody. Have a great Friday.